talked about order from chaos and computation in, in neural networks. Jonathan. <clears throat> thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Um, so like Chinggis, I'm trained in, in, in physics and kind of find my way into theoretical neuroscience. But while Chinggis just um, advocated for why we should understand deep learning in order to understand the brain, I'm going to offer a different perspective of why perhaps we should look elsewhere and not just understanding uh, deep learning. And the basic argument behind that, which can follow through through this talk, is that our brain does more than just uh, classify cats and dogs or, or identify digit, or at least the brain of most of us. And if I'm trying to maybe pinpoint what's different, what's, what's different is just this simple feed-forward image classification is the um, basic element of time. Because when we, when we operate, we do different tasks, cognitive tasks and computation, we interact with the world, we're getting feedback back on the world, and our, our actions take time. So in those deep networks, you lose the, the time perspective in missing. Um, another thing is when we look at the brain, it's, it's, it's very dominated by a highly recurrent connection, not feedback connections, which are, are most suitable for doing computation or dynamics during time. So the framework that I'm going to talk or advocate to use is what uh, we call computation through dynamics. And the idea is this, is we have some task we want to do, and this is some interaction with the world. This can be th uh, solved using some algorithmic solution or computational solution. Now, the main idea or assumption here is that this, this uh, algorithmic solution can be implemented as a nonlinear dynamical system. Because basically, that's what the world is. That's Leaving quantum aside, basically we're all some kind of nonlinear dynamic systems. And this nonlinear dynamic system that solve the, the, uh, solve the problem can be implemented as a neural network. So if we had this uh, piece of cortical network, we get some input. The input could be uh, um, modulated by time. It could be a temporal input. Something is happening, and we get some output. And from this, we can get a variety of different uh, cognitive or computational abilities. We get memory, we can do integration, temporal pattern generation, temporal correlation, Bayesian sampling. And it allows us to do different cognitive processes as evidence accumulation, decision making, language processing, motor planning and control, sensory processing. So this is a very rich framework. And what I'm going to talk about today, you can, it, it's going to be very general, high level, but you can think about it as more temporal generation, uh, pattern generation, and motor planning, because it's, it's, really the, it's the easiest way, most stressful for way to think about this uh, dynamical system. So how do those kind of recurrent neural networks that, we, that some people in machine learning uh, work on uh, um, come to neuroscience? So a lot, uh, a lot of times they use like in silico uh, hypothesis generating framework. There, there is some network we train it, usually using back propagation through time to perform some task or to match some activity of neurons. Now this is very effective. Training with back propagation is very effective, but there's no reasonable biological, uh, biological implementation for this thing for many, many reasons. Uh, uh, this, the brain just does not do back propagation through time, or at least as we use it. Nevertheless, this has been used in a variety of neuroscience studies where they're trying to emulate the brain and then study this, this network, and actually they've been used pretty successfully. We have learned on, a lot on the brain by studying those networks. And because of this used success, it was, it's very tempting to try to understand why, how can we do a more biological backpropagation through time. And there have been such studies of trying to do it, but I feel that's pretty much not what we should be looking for. Right? We're trying to solve something not, not uh, uh, by forcing it to be something that it's not. So instead, I'm going to try and, and, and kind of propose and a little bit study a different approach. So first, a few observations on the brain. If we take an isolated neuron from our cortex and inject current into it first, I hope all of you know or heard that neurons are basically activated by spiking. They release this kind of uh, um, uh, discrete action potentials. But if we put, a, if we insert a DC current, a stable DC current, neuron fires like clockwork, clockwork, very stable. But when we look in the brain, or not only in the brain, but in, in cultured uh, uh, neural networks, we find something very different. We can have the same input to that network again and again, but each time we do it, and here on the, on the y-axis, you can see the trial, you get a very, very different uh, behavior. And we can measure the, the, the variance uh, versus the mean count, and you can see that the final factor here is about one or even larger than one. So from this very 
uh, accurate behavior, we get this very noisy behavior. But when we look at behavior, behavior is pretty reliable. If, if you think about uh, uh, what you need to do in your, in your everyday, and especially uh, specialists like tennis players and cellists, they need to, 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 to perform again and again the same action with, with high accuracy. So this is a bit of a puzzle, right? Why do we start with something very, uh, very uh, dependable, go to something completely undependable and noisy, and go back to, to, uh, uh, to very reliable behavior? Now, we're in good company. We're not the first one who's thinking about that. So uh, uh, John von Neumann asked this question uh, way, ago. How do, uh, way back, how do, especially in related to, to biological uh, computation, how do we get reliable computation with unreliable components? So the, the, the framework I'm going to use here to understand it relies on reservoir computing. Uh, it came from, the, uh, from basically from, from, from a type of machine learning. So I'm going to go, go do a quick overview of what does it mean. Imagine we have a, a, a network. So with some, this is some just recurrent network, and neurons just uh, going the day doing about what they want to do. And then we put some input into it. Let's say we perturb it in some way. And we want to make sure that when we perturb the net, we can read out specific output. You can imagine this, this input to be some uh, higher order place in the brain telling us to move the hand, and, and the output would be the actual uh, control signal to the muscles. And we want to learn it. Now, we can take a readout unit and it just connect it randomly. Obviously, we'll get nothing. So one way to do it is just do it many, many times and again, and just slowly learn, do some kind of a regression and learn those weights so we can get a good approximation. Basically, we have kind of a, the activity of those very noisy neurons which acts like a sort of a basis function. And from this basis function, we can construct any function. Of course, if this was infinite and, 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 and have enough uh, uh, nice properties, this could be the case, but the networks are not infinite. Uh, so this is pretty much limited by the basis functions that we can get from the reservoir. So, in order to improve that, there's uh, what we call reservoir computing with a closed loop. Basically, we can close this loop back onto itself, and that actually allows us to learn uh, much more. I'm not going to go into the details, but the, 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 the first, uh, uh, there are some issues of stability, but the first algorithm that were able to solve it very nicely was uh, suggested by Cecilia and Abbott. It's called the force algorithm, and they were actually were able to teach a stick man to walk. So why does it mean, what does it mean here? Basically, think of every point here on the body as contains of three outputs. And then giving an input, they just train each of this point to do the specific uh, trajectories, uh, which translates to this uh, walking man. So we're able to do, to teach a lot of things, this, uh, uh, this network, uh, dynamical patterns. Now, most of this efficient is at the edge of chaos. I'm going to talk soon about why or what's specific about the edge of chaos. It's, it's important, but that leads to some issues. First, once we learn, chaos is a train, meaning, meaning once we learn something, the network is no longer chaotic. It's part of the, what this machinery does, which means uh, uh, leads to some problems with continual learning. If we want chaos and we get rid of it once we learn something, how can we learn something new? Also, there's the issues of task inference and most importantly, which we'll touch just a bit today, which is this also is not biological plausible, this, this, this uh, uh, false algorithm. So, things I'm going to talk about today and um, hopefully get to it today. So, first is how can chaotic network faithfully encode signal computation? We want it to, be, to have a network, we want it to be chaotic or noisy, like we observe the cortex, but still get out something very reliable computation out of it. And the second part, which we'll probably get only to do briefly, is how can I count this network learned efficiently and still remain chaotic? So, a good place to start is close to the beginning, at least. So first, how do we get this chaotic network? And what's so special about it? And this goes back, actually, all the way to 1988. Some political some also, that if you, uh, if you uh, define a nonlinear recurrent network, and that's what we have here, H is the input into each neuron. We, we call it something like the membrane protection of the neuron. It follows this uh, um, differential equation, uh, where R is the output of the neuron, it's just some nonlinear function of its inputs, and they're all connected through them through some, uh, uh, through some uh, 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 disordered connectivity matrix. So the disordered JIJ is random, it's scales like one over n, very much like spin glasses. Okay? The only difference here is that J does not have to be symmetric uh, because this is not really spins, and, and neurons are not generally, the, the connection between neurons are no longer symmetric. So what they found that, and, and so we have the parameter G here, so, sorry, I is at some external input to the network. They found that if we have this parameter G here, which basically uh, says what is the amount of the disorder in the system, the magnitude of disorder, if you increase G enough, this becomes chaotic. So for small G, we look at the different neurons, so each blue line here is a neuron, we see that this network settles into some fixed point. 
nothing is happening. But if you increase the disorder in the system, basically the, the, it is going, uh, there is a transition and the system goes to be chaotic. And by chaotic, I mean every neuron is doing, is fluctuating, internal generated fluctuation, and you can actually calculate the positive life of the exponent. This is actual chaos. Interestingly, uh, we can actually find this. This is, a, a, and we find that uh, this is a, a sort of, not exact, but, but looks like a second order phase transition. Right? It's a continuous transition. And with a second order uh, uh, phase transitions come some critical effects. And those critical uh, uh, behavior of the system are actually what's favorable a lot of time for computation. For example, long time constants, strong correlation, all sorts of things. Uh, and, and this is one of the reasons that, that this edge of chaos that I just mentioned before is favorable for computing. We also found, and this will be important at the end of the talk, we'll go back to that about the dimensional, uh, the effective dimensionality. So we have, a, we have a network and it starts to be chaotic, but if we look at the dimensionality of the chaotic activity, it does not take the full space. It's just a small fraction of it, but while it's still a small fraction and this fraction increases as we increase the, the, the disorder in the system, it is extensive with the system size, and the fact that it's extensive with the system size will be important um, at the end. Okay, so we saw how we take those very clockwork neurons. There's no noise in here, but we still get chaotic behavior. And the first thing when we get a chaotic network and we want to use it is how to get rid of that chaos, because as we said, chaos is not really good for computation. It's not reliable. So how can we remove this chaos? So to, to try to understand this, I'm going to use the, very, the most simple computation we can do, a computation we can do, which is an autoencoder. What is the autoencoder here? This, this the network receives a signal X it's a low-dimensional signal. A lot of time I'm going to use just a one dimension, but everything I'm, I'm going to do today can be done in, in several dimensions, in no dimension. We're going to inject it to the network. Each new one's going to get some uh, projection of it. And we're assuming we're going to train something to read out, uh, back, read back the signal out of it. Now, no matter how well we can do, if you can see on the right, basically, we'll never get exactly the target. Why? Because the chaos brings noise. And, 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 and so we, we get some, some approximation of that. And the question is, how can we make this more exact? One way is to take infinite number of neurons, but again, the brain and the circuits are limited. So how can we increase that? Another way is to increase the signal. So we can just push a stronger signal, the signal is stronger than the noise, and then we can read it out. But this is not a very good uh, uh, plan. First, if we increase the signal, we increase the firing rate, and this is not very efficient. Second, if neurons are saturating, we're going to move away from the dynamical regime, and it's going to hurt our, our, our computing. So how can we increase the signal but still not increase the firing rate? And an easy solution is basically take back the, uh, take the output and, and, and send it back into input, uh, and so it can, uh, cancels this strong input. This needs some synaptic balance, and I'm not going to go into the details of, of how it becomes. Basically, synaptic balance means that the input into each neuron, the feedforward input and the current input, kind of balance and cancels out. So overall, the neuron does not increase its firing rate. What do we get here? We get the same thing that we saw before, but now the input is some W. W is the input projections of not of the input X, but of the difference between X or, or N and X. Uh, um, uh, in our, our uh, uh, estimation. So this is, uh, and if we take B to be stronger and stronger, this is what we call predictive coding. Why is it predictive coding? Because what the new neuron now are coding are not X, but deviation for the expectation of X, deviation between X and X hat. And this is known to be very efficient uh, uh, um, energetically wise or for firing level wise, but it's also been found in different animal systems that they, uh, we actually found and show that it's happening. And we can see what happens uh, on the right. We'll see what happens when we do that. We can increase uh, this uh, effective B, make B larger. This is as we go down. We can see that the, the readout becomes much, much more faithful. We have less readout error, but the underlying system remains chaotic. So this is a system, but now that we, ha we have that, the question is, let's, let's now let's do some math. Let's do some theory, which we kind of uh, avoided till now. And how do we solve it? This will be the most technical slide of this talk. Uh, I'm not going to solve the entire mean field, but I want to give you the, the, the main idea, the main conceptual idea of solving it. So we have this uh, high nonlinear dimensional system and, uh, of the H's, and we wanna, we're going to divide the H's into two spaces. One is a coding sub subspace, uh, uh, which is basically where all the code lives, or where, where the input and the output lives, and the rest, which we call the bulk. And, and we'll assume that X, the, the dimensionality is much smaller than the number of neurons, and we also assume, it's not what, that, that the that the Ws are, are basically also normal, and for large network, random would be good enough, for example, for 
So now we can solve for those things separately. If we look first on the bulk, uh, basically what, what we have this addition that we have here by removing the, the, the low rank or the low dimensional thing is just a very small, cor small correction to the activity. And, and if, you, if you look at that, that looks like the original chaotic equation from, from a few uh, slides ago. So basically this would just give us chaotic dynamics in this bulk space. If we look on the, on the, on the coding space, we can, we can define uh, uh, those U, which are basically the, the, the field in the direction of the coding, and, uh, uh, and we get a, a lower dimensional uh, uh, equation for the, for the behavior. And now this is where the trick lies of how we can do it, because what I've done till now, I, I've, I've taken a nonlinear dynamical equation, and I've broken it up like it's, a, like it's a linear dynamics. Obviously, we cannot do this, but this is where the trick lies, because uh, D is very small, so we have interaction between those two spaces, but the inter in the bulk space, it barely feels the interaction due to the coding space because it's that small, and all the interaction of the bulk, uh, of the bulk space goes into this noise term. So in the mean field, we can look, uh, just look at it as noise and just study its properties. The, further thing we can, uh, the last thing we can do to solve this equation, just look at, at, U, uh, at this uh, field U, and, and divide it into its mean, uh, and the mean here is, is, a, is like a thermal mean or a mean over the noise, as you can look at it, or mean over time, and the fluctuation, and then we solve a static mean field or first order mean field for, for the mu, and that will give us the bias in the estimation of, uh, of XS eventually, and we can use second order mean field or dynamic mean field to solve the fluctuations and give us the, the other, the fluctuating error of the readout. And that's basically the framework uh, uh, for the mean field. What we get from that, so this is, I, I'm showing you here the solution. So first you see that delta H is all the ones, meaning that the underlying neurons are, are all chaotic and, and they're dancing and they're juggling about. Uh, but as we increase B, we can see, that we can see the decrease um, of the overall error, and the error here is, here it's not the U, but it's already the fluctuations in the actual readout. And I've put here the, for reference, both from theory and simulation, what happens in, instead of chaos, we would have noise. So, the blue one is what, in, in case of a chaotic network, would just inject Gaussian noise. And it's an interesting thing that, that this, this framework is much more effective in, in reducing this chaotic noise than just, than just uh, thermal noise. And this helps computation, and another reason why we want to use, use chaotic networks. It, it actually has a very interesting uh, reason due to the time constant of the system, and, and, and you, can, you can look at this paper if you want to, to understand more about what, why is the difference here between, especially in the appendix of this paper. Okay, so one more thing. Uh, you can say, great, we can remove now the fluctuation. We can get good, reliable readout. Why not just increase B to infinity and remove all the noise that we have the most reliable output? But that's not the case. And we get, went back to John von Neumann, who said every network or nervous system has a definite time lag uh, between the input and the output. So the time lag will become important. And why that? Is that because of hipsters. So why hipsters? I'm going to use here, uh, uh, I'm going to quote here Jonathan Tubul. Uh, on a paper he wrote on PPX, when, when non-conformists try and stray from mainstream trend, they oftentimes end up making the same choices because they are too slow to spot no longer popular trends. Too slow. That's, that's the key point here. And this too slow basically is our delay. Imagine that whatever, whoever calculated the, this readout there, or in this case it's just linear, but it could be something more complicated, it took time for the feedback to come back. So where does this feedback enter in our equation? Uh, you can you can think about yourself that it's pretty much in the coding subspace because in the chaotic subspace there's chaos, chaos is there's symmetry over, over time, so, so the delay doesn't really matter there. But where it matters is this coding subspace. What does this uh, uh, thing do? We can write the characteristic equation for this, uh, for this ODE and look for its stability, and its stability is when this uh, gamma here uh, uh, disappears, becomes zero, and we're left only with, with the imaginary part. And, that's and that basically depends on B, and B on, on, or, or B times this uh, uh, thermal average over the derivative of the, of the nonlinearity. So we can plot it and we can see a phase transition. Below that, we'll have stable dynamics, and above it, we're gonna, we're gonna develop strong fluctuation. You can see it here. Below it, we have some, we have some noise that we've seen before where we can, we can actually follow the output, but if we go to the non-stable oscillatory regime, we're gonna, we are developing strong fluctuations. And this, is, uh, and this depends, uh, uh, and this is uh, as a function of the B, uh, of, the, of the amount of feedback. But, we, but uh, so what's new here, basically, we can see that there's global instability and oscillation in the mean field. So this whole oscillations come in the mean field, while the underlying, if you look at the underlying neuron, they're still chaotic, still very much chaotic. 
So like we've changed the, the B also depends not, not only uh, 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 on the delay here, but it also depends on, on the noise, and the noise goes through the fluctuation through this thermal average over phi, and we can change the amount of chaos, for example, the G from before, the G was the amount of disorder in the system, we can change it, and actually we can see that we can stabilize the chaos. If we add more chaos, the system becomes more unstable, uh, 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 sorry, more stable, while we remove the chaos, it becomes more unstable. The intuition behind that basically is this, this, this delayed feedback trying to synchronize neurons, like those hipsters, while noise and chaos trying to desynchronize neurons, because each one gets some, some independent noise. So these are the two opposite effects, and every time we get two opposite effects, we get trade-off, and when we get trade-off, we get optimality, and we can actually calculate that. So here we see the calculation for the mean field. So we look at the fluctuations of the output. Uh, it's all come from the source that comes from the, from the, from the chaos. Uh, but there are two, it depends on two terms. The first term is what we talked about before. When we add the balance, it, grows, it, it goes like 1 over b, uh, uh, and, and larger balance, sorry, not larger feedback, uh, and more balance in the synapses makes us remove, and this is what we can see here without, without any kind of delays in the, in, the, in, the, in the blue. But once we have delays and there is a critical level of balance, there is also some resonant uh, uh, point which, 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 which attracts those, those, those fluctuations, and we can see as, as we increase that, something, uh, the, the fluctuations, and specifically around this frequency, increase. And when we have those two things, we expect to find optimality, so we can see here that here we cha I, I, on, uh, I change the, the, number of, the, the amount of noise, the G, and we can see as, as, we, as we increase, we can find at the total fluctuation, there is an optimal point. Going back a little bit to biology, so what we actually uh, 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 now predict, that the wish for, at optimality, we should see some oscillations in the brain, and indeed we see oscillations in the brain. And not only that, we can say that the oscillation basically, um, the oscillation basically depends uh, on, on the amount of the delay. And what the amount of delay is depends on, on this whole feedback chain that we saw. For example, if the feedback is just a small feedback within the network, we'd expect only external delays, we would see a uh, fluctuation in the high gamma regime that we record in the brain. But if we look at, if, if this delay has to go through several synapses or several networks until it comes back, we'd expect oscillation closer to the theta regime. And one thing we're trying to check now with experiment is to verify this kind of uh, finding if they are related. Okay, so what did we get uh, so far? And I have to run, I guess, because there's not much time left, uh, is we got cortical activity which is a basic pattern generator, but with this kind of, we still get a low error decoding subspace which we can use decode, and we can go an arbitrary linear dynamical system. I haven't shown that, I just an auto encoder, but with this simple setting, we can do arbitrary dynam uh, dynamical linear system, and at optimality, we find finite level disorder and global oscillation. So going back to what I wanted to show, we said one thing is how to, we can encode with, with chaotic network, the second, how can we learn? I'm gonna go very fast about that, and, um, um, because I'm out of time. So remember that we looked at this force algorithm. Uh, so we kind of understood maybe how we can uh, uh, solve the, the problems of chaos in continual learning because we keep the chaos after learning. But what about task inference and more biological learning? So for that, we look again at the brain. And we're looking for this kind of feedback mechanism that we have in the brain. We actually find them. And the key thing for that is a cerebellum. Cerebellum sits here on the back of our, uh, of our head. And while it's sometimes called a small brain, it actually holds more neurons than the rest of the brain altogether. So it's a very important part of the brain that's been developed uh, uh, um, with the neocortex from the beginning. And actually, we can find something similar even in the brains of the flies. So, it's a, uh, uh, beyond, that, so, so beyond that, we know that it has a very distinctive uh, uh, structure unlike the cortex, which is a random neural network or something more uh, interconnected, it's more layer-wise, it looks a little bit more like a deep network. But we know that damage to the cerebellum leads to deficiency in learning, especially motor, but not only. And it, it's layer-wise, and it's connected to the cortex as a video, and it gets input from the cortex and puts its output to the cortex. So if you, you guessed it, the kind of idea is to take this uh, 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 um, uh, output loops that we've done for the force, but replace it with uh, something like the cerebellum that can actually learn this output in a more efficient way. So one, one thing you can see, this is very huge layer, so this is a layer in the cerebellum called the granule cell, it's a very, very huge layer that's very conservative in, and very typical to the structure of the cerebellum, that is a huge expansion, like a, it's a feed-forward layer with a huge expansion as it, as it comes from the cortex. So actually, we're gonna focus about what this layer does to the learning. And, and I'm gonna run through that, so, so the idea or kind of the intuition of, of what it does, uh, we, we can think of, imagine that this is a cortex now, now let's ignore the recurrent connectivity, but there are some 
blob of activity. Each blob could be something that, that we want to learn or activity in some way or, or, or representation of different tasks. And what we uh, have seen in, in, in before in, in previous work that as we increase the size of this cerebellar layer uh, and the sparsity of activity net, we can read things from that much more easier. The kind of intuition is that if we look at the cortical layer and then we have those different blobs and each one of them again is a, is a, is a task representation or dynamical type of representation, in the cerebellum it's going to look something like that. So it's much easier to read out from. Uh, intuition, basically, cerebellum uh, looks with a magnifying glass into the motor cortex and helps us learn more effectively. How can we show that? Uh, again, without theory, but just some, uh, 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 some, some numerics. Let's take two, two networks and, and see what do you mean by effective learning. So we have this recurrent network, like the force that we just said, and it gets different input. Each one is a different uh, static pattern that it gets in the pools, and we want to, to, to teach it to, for each pulse to, to do a different target. So it gets, different neurons get activated, we want it to get, to produce different output. Each one would say, one would be move your arm this way, one would be move your arm that way. And we ask, how can we learn it? What is the effect of learning it? And how do we, how do we, um, uh, what do we do with efficiency? How we define efficiency? Basically, what happens when we add more neurons? So in, in, one, in one way, when we have this force, like we can take and add more neurons into the cortical layer. Well, on the cerebellar kind of uh, architecture, we keep the cortex straight, but uh, fixed, but we add neurons into the uh, into the uh, cerebellar layer. As you can see, that if you look at the, uh, without the expansion or without the cerebellum, if we add more neurons, we don't really improve the efficiency of our learning. But if we add neurons to that big layer, we can see that 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 the error drops like one over n, like what would we expect? Without going into the theory, why do we see that? Now I'll go back to the beginning and what I said about, about the chaos and, and the dimensionality is, is basically that what, when we have these chaotic systems in here, when we have some dynamics, then it's, it's a low dimensional but extensive with the size. So as we add more neurons here, we're actually adding more dimensions to the, to the arrow. What, well, instead of we're adding them here, we are able actually to remove out uh, the arrow. Okay, so to finish up, uh, um, basically what we're doing now, or going next, is, 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 is doing to a more ce full cerebellar-like structure of this, and this actually maybe relates to other works here, what Chingis said about deep learning, is how to, to learn those dynamical systems in cortex, but using the power of, of somehow a deep learning or deep learning with wide layers, which we know a lot about, but we can now connect it to our... Um, um, to, uh, uh, to the cortex. One more thing that we've done, but I didn't have time to show that using this expansion, we can actually start using, or at least in some cases, start, start using local learning or something like heavy and learning, meaning that we can move away from this for forced learning and use this kind of mechanism to learn in a, in a biological plasma way. To summarize, so we have shown that the disorder and chaos makes cortical networks good pattern generation uh, data, and it's a good, uh, 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 and, and we can use it uh, for learning, this diversity of patterns. Feedback is allows reliable, low dimensional task encoding. And cerebral like expansion allows efficient learning of low dimensional tasks and representation. Thank you very much. These are uh, my uh, group members and collaborators. Uh, uh, Bolded are the ones that are that, 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 that I'm working with something that at least related to this work. And if anyone is interested in that, please come talk. I have vacancies for PhDs and postdocs. And thank you for your time. Very nice. Thank you very much. I'm sure there's going to be I'm sure there's going to be questions. I think Ale was the first one. Do you have any idea why force kills chaos? Why it kills chaos? Yeah, why, why doesn't, doesn't you What is the mechanism same? or why? Yeah, yeah, what is the mechanism? So when you, when you increase this, when, when this you, you create this loop, basically you, you can change uh, the point or, or you increase the size, uh, a loop with the input, you can change the, uh, the transition to chaos. That's basically uh, the assumption. Actually, I haven't, I, I haven't tried to look exactly what it happens as, as a function of learning, but the assumption is that, uh, especially if you are in, in those nonlinear networks in, in TAN H, and it works less well with, with, with ReLU, but the strength of the input of, of the slope changes the, the, goes into the calculation of the transition to chaos. So it can changes and basically uh, move it. And that's why it works 
close to the transition. If you're at the edge of chaos, you don't need much to move to, to, to become more stable. So it has a bias some, somehow. Sorry? Like it prefers to not use chaos in your way, you know. Uh, find well, you try to try to do something that it's not chaotic, right? I mean, you have a very, um, the output is very, is very reliable. Thank you. Stefan. Thank you. Um, I probably missed uh, how did you perform the analysis in the second piece of your talk when you started to have uh, a hidden layer before the readout after the reservoir? Oh, I didn't miss. I didn't talk about it. Okay. Can you comment on that? Oh, on which part? You mean on, on, on that here? Uh, um, yeah. Okay. This? Th this one. Okay, so the analysis we've done here, at least what I'm, what I'm showing here, it's, for, it's for, for static patterns. So forget now the recurrent activity, and we just look at, at static pattern, and imagine that uh, here we get an input, some set of static patterns, and what we want to do is just basically train um, a readout. So if we th think about it in biology, this would be some kind of cortex, this would be like a granule cell, and this would be like a Purkinje cell that needs to learn out of them. And, and the idea is to ask, okay, let's have just the, some, the Purkinje cells are uh, active only for some of the output. So basically, they correlate those different tasks. So all we need now to do is to be able to ask what happens if I have a readout and I want to ask to train a network so, so R, this output, is positive only for an arbitrary uh, uh, um, subset of, uh, of, 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 of the labels, just arbitrary of them. And then we ask how can we make this arbitrary classification so each output can only listen or, or transmit some of them. Uh, and for that, you, you can look in those, I mean, there's work with uh, uh, Baktash Babadi with Sampolinsky, and we have, a, 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 I think it's a new paper from 2016, that we use this kind of uh, uh, I, uh, ideas. And basically what we're doing is just implementing, implementing that, Not now we're doing it, implementing it with, with the recurrent connectivity. I will check the paper probably. Thank you. And there's another question from Ada. And I have a feeling I know in which direction it's going to go. <laughs> so concerning dynamical mean field theory, when you talk about the, the two subspaces, so the coding subspace and the bulk subspace, how you do determine the noise? In a self-consistent way? Is it correlated to the other parts? Or, okay, so... Uh, the eta term. So... Yes. Right here? Part. Okay. So... The eta term comes from, from the bath, or from the chaotic bath. Now the contribution of this part of the coding size space is negligible. So I can solve a dynamic mean field for here without with just ignoring the uh, subspace, because the contribution is just of order d over, the square root d over n, and it's much, much smaller than n. So here we get chaos. And once we have the chaos here, and I have the autocorrelation function of, of, of the activity in the bulk, Basically, eta is the autocorrelation. So it's not Gaussian noise now. It's going to be... Okay, this it's was not my Gaussian, question. It's so it's related so to the actually, other. what I was referring here, it comes from the fact that the autocorrelation of, of the difference between Gaussian noise is its autocorrelation is not Gaussian. Thanks. Thank you. Are there... I don't see any more immediate questions. So let's thank the two speakers of uh, this afternoon's session once again. Recording stopped.